Well, I'm glad to see that a few people stayed. Sometimes I, I think sometimes I get people cranked up and upset or whatever, and they, they leave and don't come back for the next session. People always want to know a little bit about the speaker. I mentioned a little bit in the first service. I remember a salvation experience when I was age eight in Thailand. But when I went down to that Answers in Genesis seminar in West Palm Beach and heard Henry Morris speak, yeah. Dr. John Morris, Ken Ham, and then I left that place with a copy of that book, Evolution of the Lie, and started reading it, I read Henry Morris's The Genesis Record, and my head was just throbbing. My wife thinks that's when I was saved, because that's when she noticed the big change. Isn't there supposed to be a change when the Holy Spirit converts you? And so maybe I can claim to salvation. I don't know. Actually, I do know this, that if Jesus Christ is not who he says he is, I'm done. There's nowhere else to go. He's the only one that provides that salvation. <laughs>This particular topic uh, I've simply titled The Consequences of the Path That You Choose because there are consequences to what we choose to believe. And I'm going to try to tie a few really important points together in this one, maybe drag a couple of points from the earlier ones into this one so we can see once again the relevance of the creation issue. If you have your Bibles, once again turn with me to Proverbs chapter 4 verse 18 and 19. <clears throat> Excuse me. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18 and 19, where we read, But the path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more into the perfect day. The way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not at what they stumble. Our Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll help this speaker just step aside. Lord, let the glory and truth of your word shine through. Cut through to those hearts that you've determined to speak. Lord, we'll be careful to give you the honor, the glory, and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, I remember that early salvation experience. I remember the change that took place after I heard the two of those, or three of those men speak. It began to change. My life changed. My focus changed. And I can tell you truthfully, that if you would have told me 25 years ago that I would be doing what I am doing today, I'd have said you were crazy as a loony too. Because I started, I'd been kicked around for 10 years after I got out of school, didn't know what I wanted to be when I grow up. My wife says I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> Actually, when we came back from Thailand in 62, for the next three or four, no, actually six years, Every late spring, actually it was the Friday before the Memorial Day weekend, I would be on a Greyhound bus headed for Nebraska where my grandparents farmed. And then the Friday before Labor Day, I was on another Greyhound bus going back home because school started the Tuesday after Labor Day. That's the way it was. I farmed all summer. loved it. I mean, come on. What young guy wouldn't like it? Driving tractors and... You know what I'm talking about. Amen. Of course, everybody knows there's no real tractors except for John Deere. Yeah. We got that. Okay, we got some John Deere people here. All right. <laughs> but I, I thought I wanted to be a farmer. I loved it. And so what I did was I took four years of vocational agriculture, FFA. Do they have FFA around here? Okay. They taught you how to do things like uh, tractor mechanics, automobile mechanics, welding, um, you know, all of the different skill sets that a man needed to know in order to be a successful farmer, yeah. right? One of the things that they did in the Iowa, and I, I went to high school in Iowa, FFA, was they had an extemporaneous, extemporaneous speaking contest every year. My ag teacher, Mr. Detman, talked me into joining or entering that contest. To this day, I don't know how he did it, but he did. 
Teachers are good at twisting their, their arm, aren't they? So I prepared a little 20 minute speech on a really interesting subject called soil conservation. Went to Des Moines on the day of the contest, waited on pins and needles, finally became my turn so I went in before the judges and I gave my little 20 minute speech, came back out to the hallway, waited on pins and needles, finally they came out and told me that I had won third place. And boy was I proud until I found out only three people had entered the contest. Now that is a true story. So if you came here today thinking you're going to hear some big eloquent speaker, I think you need to kind of set that one aside. I do what I do because God called me to do it. And I'm going to tell you something. If God calls you to do something, he will equip you to do what he's called you to do. In fact, he says all things work together for those, what? That are called according to his purpose. Right? So when we look at this subject this morning, I want you to not, Pay attention to what I'm trying to say in the sense that I'm saying it. I want you to look at it as a message from the Lord. Because it's an important message. The path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more to the perfect day. The way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not at what they stumbled. I wondered a long time, what are these two paths? Where are they leading? Where do they wind up in the end? And you know, God himself answers that question just a couple of chapters further down in Proverbs chapter, uh, Proverbs chapter, I believe it's chapter 12. Let me look real quick. I'll tell you. Proverbs 14 verse 12 had the reversed. He says, there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is the ways of death. Now, I would venture to say, most people today would probably agree when I say that if God says something, you need to... Pay attention, don't you? Yeah. But when he says it twice, you really need to pay attention. And just a few chapters further down in Proverbs 16, verse 25, he says it again. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Now today, the path that seems right to most people, the path that many, many Americans are choosing to follow, is what I call the path of evolutionary humanism. Now I just hate it when speakers use big words. You know, they're 15 minutes in their message, and I'm still hung up back there on the big word trying to figure out what it meant. You ever have that problem? Yeah. Happens to me all the time. All right, let's break that apart. Evolutionary humanism. Humanism is relatively simple to understand. It's about me. Everything is about me. I'm the center of the universe. It's what I like. It's what I want. It's what I need. It's what I care about. That's what humanism is. Evolution, on the other hand, has come to mean a lot of things to a lot of people and I really need to be specific about defining it. Like I said earlier, John Moore says evolution teaches from goo to you by way of the zoo, that's how you all got here. And that is kind of a funny cutesy way to say it, but in essence that's what they teach. But you see what they're teaching is one kind evolved into a higher, more complex kind over and over again to get from particles to people. We're talking about vertical evolution here. That's what they teach in the public education system. We are not talking about horizontal variation within a kind. God programmed the variation within the kind in the first pair that he made of that kind. And as they began to reproduce, all of those variations began to show up. How do we know that? Because when you get to the limit of the kind, they become sterile. They won't breed any further, like a mule, for instance. Well, today people have started to follow this path of evolutionary humanism. Let me define evolution. Actually, I think I can use an example of what happened to me down in Peru. We have a couple of missionaries down there. And I've been down there three trips. Uh, on the second trip, I believe it was, I went down there. It might have been the third. I walked out of Georgia's airport in Lima. And there on the far left-hand side of the parking lot at the airport in Lima was this huge billboard sign. Now, Lima is a city of 12 million, so this is a big city. And here is this huge... Actually, later I had a... V8 moment, you know. Not that I wanted to have a V8, but that I wished I'd have taken a picture of the sign because if I had, I wouldn't have to explain to you or describe to you what was on the sign. Why? Because a picture tells a thousand words, doesn't it? Yeah. Kind of like this 
picture tells a thousand words. You wouldn't want to make a decision here, would you? Can't you just see the highway patrolman? He's there waiting to write you a ticket, right? Well, there on the far left-hand side of this huge billboard, and this billboard illustrates my definition of evolution, was a picture of an old Tandy 1000 SX computer. See a couple of heads nodding. It had two, mind you, two five and a half inch 360K floppy drives. Not meg, not gig, not teraflops, K, 360K. Next day was a picture of a computer that had a little three and a half inch floppy drive. Some of you may remember those. Then was a picture of a computer with hard drives and zip drives. Finally, on the far right hand side was a picture of one of these wafer thin laptop computers that we can buy today. And emblazoned in words across the top of the, of the sign in letters taller than I am were the words, the evolution of the computer. Now to the person that dreamed up that advertising campaign, the word evolution meant what? Change, right? That's all it means, change. Have computers changed? You got that one wrong. Yeah, they've changed. Oh, okay. All right. You and me are going to have to have some talk afterward. <laughs> no. I mean, seriously now. Let me get back and get seriously. He's a great guy. I love Take a look at this. This is a picture of a 40 megabyte hard drive from 1967. It took a forklift to lift it up and put it in the back of a computer, or I mean the back of an airplane. I mean, take a look. You talk about change. Yes, computers have changed a lot. They've been talking about for a number of years now a computer that will project a virtual keyboard on the tabletop where you type on the keyboard, or two pens that you keep in your pocket. One projects the screen on the wall, the other projects the keyboard. Have computers changed? Yeah, they've changed a lot. Of course, they're still computers, and you're right. But their form has changed a lot. That's not what evolution means. They're teaching vertical evolution from particles to people over millions of years. Folks, there's never been any evidence that it happened even once, let alone a whole number of times. You see, what they're teaching is this. They're teaching that man is the God in control of his own life, that man determines truth, that man can change the definition of truth anytime he wants to. What they're really teaching is that man is that God, makes all his own decisions, decides for himself what's true and what's not true, and if he doesn't like what he decided, he'll change it, make it something different, right? You see, man, the top of the food chain. See, I pointed this out earlier. Evolution is a worldview that teaches through process of death, disease, bloodshed, and struggle over millions of years. That's what brought man into existence. The Bible, on the other hand, teaches something very different. It teaches no. God created a perfect man. Sin is what brought, or man's sin is what brought death, disease, bloodshed, and the world has been going downward ever since. Now here's the key. Evolution is an idea about how man got here without a God being involved. Creation is an idea about how man got here with God doing it. And they are two different worldviews. They are going in opposite directions. In fact, many Christians today who think that you can add the millions of years of, to, of evolution to the Bible don't understand this one simple slide. They are two different worldviews. They are going in opposite directions. They wind up in two different destinations, each carrying two different sets of eternal consequences. And one of the things the church has begun to forget today is the fact that ideas have consequences. Let me illustrate that. I mean, you know who this guy is. His name's Adolf Hitler. What you may not know about Hitler is that he believed Darwinian biological evolution hook, line, and sinker. He believed Darwin was right, that we all evolved from some common ape-like ancestor. Therefore, Hitler reasoned, that means some of us are further along the evolutionary line than others. That makes us superior. And it's a lie. Racism comes right out of the pit of hell. It is not biblical. Paul says in Acts chapter 17, we are all of one blood. There is only one. But, but, but Hitler didn't believe that. 
He believed Darwin was right. That's why he didn't see any problem at all of killing millions of gypsies, Jews, and blacks. Why? He was simply being true to his worldview when he came to power. He was exterminating, in his view, subspecies of humans that had not evolved as far as the Aryan race had. Thank goodness he was not allowed to prevail. We'd be living in a very different world than we are today, wouldn't we? Unfortunately, we've had a few other Hitlers around since then, haven't we? We've got a few of them right now. Folks, he wasn't allowed to prevail, and that was by the providence of God. You see, we're talking about two different worldviews here. Creation is an idea that's built on God's Word. Evolution is an idea built on man's opinion. Now, depending on which one of the two you believe, it colors and shapes every action you make every day of your life, whether you realize it or not. For instance, if you believe that evolution is how you got here, out of that comes all types of behavior like school violence, lawlessness, homosexual behavior, pornography, so forth. You could probably think of enough blocks to stack that all the way through the ceiling. On the other hand, if you believe in the God's Word is the foundation of everything, what it means is it means that you should understand that if God created it, He owns it and everything in it. Right? If he owns it, what does that mean? It means he has a right to set the rules for living life. If he has a right to set the rules for living life, it means he has the right to set the penalty for breaking the rules. And young person here today, you listen to me. If God had the power to create the heavens and the earth in the first place, you can count on the fact that he has the power to execute the penalty when you break the rules. Breaking the rules is called sin. The penalty for sin is death and banishment for all eternity in a place called the lake of fire. Yeah. Folks, God isn't messing around here. He didn't fool around with Adam. He told him exactly what was going to happen to him if he ate of that tree. Of course, we know what happened. But you see, that's not what they're teaching in the public schools today. They're teaching that man is the top of the food chain, that man's the God in control of his own life. They're teaching our young people that they evolved upward through the animals. As a matter of fact, you want to know how to build a bomb in the public education system? This is how you do it. You instill in the child that there are no absolutes. Teach them that life is an accident. Teach them that people are nothing more than evolved animals. Millions of years of death, disease, bloodshed, and struggle. That's what brought man into existence. Then, remove the Bible, prayer, and Ten Commandments from the schools. Just stand back and wait. People, it will explode. And then we wonder why kids take guns into school like Columbine and blow away a bunch of their classmates. That shouldn't surprise us. We've been teaching them that they're nothing more than animals. Why would we be surprised when they begin to act like animals? Shouldn't surprise us. And of course, this happened over and over and over again since Columbine. See, we're talking about two different worldviews here. There was a guy named Jim Black that wrote a number, or he wrote a book a number of years ago, about 25 years ago or so. And in that book, he identified 10 things that could bring a culture crashing down around us. Ten, ten things that could cause the collapse of a culture or a nation. Now let me show you those ten things Mr. Black identified. Number one was simply an increase in lawlessness. Number two was a loss of economic discipline in the culture. Another one was rising bureaucracy, especially government red tape. Yet another one was the decline or the dumbing down of the educational standards. If the kids can't pass the test, lower the standards. Another one was a weakening of cultural foundations. Yes, another one was a loss of respect for traditions. Folks, traditions is the way we pass moral values on to the next generation. Now, they can be bad or good moral values, but that's the way they're passed on. Another one was an increase in materialism. Yet another was the rise in immorality, especially the homosexual form of it. The decay of religious belief, and finally, number 10, the devaluing of human life. Now, he found out something else during his research. All it took is one or two of these to bring a culture crashing down. Indeed, two of them were what brought down the mighty Roman Empire. But he also found out something else. For the first time in history, all 10 of them are present in the same nation at the same time. 
You nailed it. America. I don't know about the rest of you, but that's a little scary to me. Pastor, when you study the Old Testament, what happens when God judges his people, his Israel? He did it over and over. The innocent suffer right along with the guilty. So don't you sit there fat, dumb, and happy saying, well, I don't do any of those things, so I don't got to worry about it. Oh, yes, you do. Because when God judges the culture, we're all going to suffer. And I dare say many, many Christians across this great nation of the United States are already beginning to suffer. The persecution is unbelievable in the public education system. Our missionaries went to Peru and the first two years they were down there were invited to over 40 universities to speak. I got to pull eye teeth to get an invitation to a university in this country. It's just incredible. Now, each person here this morning is free to believe in whatever one of these two worldviews you want to believe. Nobody's standing with a gun to your head saying you have to believe in one or the other. At least not in this country, not yet. But while you're free to believe whichever one of these two worldviews you want to believe, you are not free of the consequences that come with the choice. And not only do the consequences affect you when you make the choice, they affect your family, your church, your school, your community. They affect the entire United States. People ask me all the time, what's going on in this country? It seems like the wheels run off in the last 40 or 50 years. I'll tell you what's happening. What we are seeing is the cumulative choices of millions of Americans choosing to believe in evolutionary humanism, and now their actions are resulting in all of these terrible things that we see going on. What was the passage we looked at? But the path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more of the perfect day. The way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not at what they stumble. So the first question I have for you this morning is this. What path are you on? Are you on the wrong path? You're beginning to think that maybe God somehow used evolution over those billions? The good news is if you're on the wrong path, you can change the path you're on. That's what the gospel is all about. Once you die and step through that veil into eternity, you're done. Now is the day of salvation. Now, it used to puzzle me. It used to bother me. What's going on? How have we allowed this to happen? Pastor, I ask the question many times. How have we as a church allowed this to happen? But then I had to turn it inward and say, wait a minute, Jim. How have you allowed this to happen? I'll tell you how we've allowed it to happen as a group of believers. It's happened because we have allowed the secular humanist to define the debate. We let them do that in a lot of things. I, I mentioned it yesterday, but I mentioned it again this morning. We, for, for instance, take abortion. We've let them say that abortion is about a woman's right to choose. That's how they've defined the debate. Folks, a woman has always had a right to choose. And the choice is made by the man also when they lay down and have a relationship. But once conception takes place, you no longer have the right to murder the life of the unborn. Yeah, that's, right. that's why we've lost that debate, people. It's not about a woman's right to choose. It's about a woman's right to murder her unborn. And the man makes the choice too. I don't want to run that rabbit trail, but we've done the same thing when it comes to evolution versus creation. We've let them say that evolution is science, but creation is religion. You want to believe that religious stuff? Go ahead, keep it to the four walls of your churches, but don't you bring it out here into the public arena because we teach real science out here. That's the way we've let them define it. Folks, evolution is not science, never has been, and never will be. Forgive me if I get a little bit passionate about this subject, but folks, it had such a huge difference in my life. A young man given every opportunity, every advantage, born into a Christian home, raised on the mission field, pastor's father for another 50 years after we came back from Thailand. Evolution's not science, never has been. Somebody's thinking, okay, this guy's gone right over the top. Well, let's go there for just a second. What is science? Well, first of all, science is a noun. That's just in case I got some English teachers here. We want to get that right, right? For but science has been defined for a long time as a branch of knowledge or study dealing with a body of facts, systematically arranged and showing the operation of the general laws. 
Then, about 40 years ago, they added a second major definition, and that is the systematic knowledge of the physical or material world that's been gained through observation and experimentation. Now, I want to apply both of these to creation and evolution. Let's see which one's science. Let's see which one's religion. Let's see if they're both science or both religion or what's what. All right, first of all, evolution. Is evolution based upon a branch of knowledge or study? Does it be deal with a body of facts? Is it systematically arranged? Does it show the operation of the general laws of science? No. Remember, I defined it for you. Vertical evolution from particles to people. Folks, not a single fact supports vertical evolution, let alone, alone a whole body of facts. But I'm not even going there. Let's talk about the second law of thermodynamics. Does it support the general laws? No. The second law of thermodynamics is the law of entropy. Everything is wearing out and breaking down. Everything is going from complexity to simplicity, from high order to disorder. Nothing in this universe is not subjected to that law. In fact, I like to point out that I'm a perfect example of it. I mean, all you got to do is look at me. My eyes don't see as good as they used to. My memory deserted me a long time ago. And of course, everything's definitely moving down. What does evolution teach, folks? It teaches everything is evolving upwards into higher and higher, more complex life forms. It's going directly contrary to one of the two most proven laws of science. All right, what about the second definition? Is it based upon the systematic knowledge of the physical or material world that's been gained through observation and experimentation? See, what is empirical science? In order to be empirical science, we call it the scientific method, what is it? It has to encompass three things. Number one, it must be observable. Got some students out there. Number two, must be testable. Number three, it must be repeatable or falsifiable, right? That is empirical science. Has anybody ever seen vertical evolution from one kind evolve into something higher? No, never seen it. Have they ever found any evidence that it happened in the past? No. Folks, they've been looking for the missing link for 150 years since Darwin first posited the idea. There's a reason they call it the missing link. Still missing. What does it mean? It means evolution. Vertical evolution, particles to people, is outside of the realm of empirical science. Therefore, it is philosophical. It is a faith-based belief system. People believe it even though there's no scientific evidence to support it. Now, I've already established in this presentation that you can believe it if you want to. But there's consequences that come with that choice. What about creation? Is anybody there when God created the stuff in the beginning? No. Is God creating stuff out of nothing today? No. What does that mean? Creation is also outside of the realm of empirical science. It is philosophical. It's faith-based. So what we have here is two faith-based belief systems that are competing. There I say we have two religions that are competing. Now, every true follower of Jesus Christ, a born-again Christian, knows that biblical Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship with the Creator. But the world looks at it as a religion. So you need to be able to talk at them and with them about that. You know, one of the things that used to drive me crazy is they like to say, oh, well, no real scientist with a real PhD from a real university believes in creation. All of the real scientists know that evolution's a fact. Well, I'm here to differ with them, folks. There's thousands of men with PhDs that believe God created it just like he said he did. In fact, there's a book back there on the table called In Six Days, Why 50 PhDs Believe God created it just like he said. They write a chapter from their scientific discipline, for him, his or her scientific discipline, explaining why the science from their discipline supports young earth biblical creation. Actually, there's a second book now that you can get on the Answers in Genesis website, called, on the AIG website called The Seventh Day, 40 more PhDs. 
Now there's another problem that we run into all the time that I want to go right to the heart of, and that is the problem of the evidence. You see, I, I kind of pointed this out yesterday at the college, but what we need to understand is there is an argument about the evidence. The average person thinks, well, over here in this pile is all the scientific evidence that supports evolution and shows it to be true, and over here in this pile is all the scientific evidence that supports creation and shows it to be true. And there's this big argument and debate going on. The evolutionists are saying our evidence is better than yours. The creation are saying, no, ours is better than yours. Folks, that's not what's going on at all. doesn't matter whether you are an evolutionist or a creationist. We have exactly the same pile of evidence to look at. The only difference is the presuppositions that you look at the evidence with. There's one of those big words, presupposition. What is it? It's your worldview. It's what you believe about how you got here and came to be. Candy and I have been to the Grand Canyon many times. Let me, let me just illustrate this for you. The last 18 years, we've, we've, we've rafted down it a couple of times. We've hiked into it from both the north and the south rim. We've flown over it in a small airplane multiple times. We were just out there last May, a few months ago, flew over Grand Canyon. In fact, I mentioned that, uh, that I actually landed that Mooney at the bottom of Grand Canyon. That was a real experience, I'll tell you what. Didn't have no glaciers out there, but I'll tell you this, my wingtip stuck over both edges of the wing of the runway about five or six feet on each side. Very interesting. Uh, interesting uh, what they call density altitudes out there. Anyway, pilots know what I'm talking about. But we were out there and we, I think it was 2003 or four, somewhere in there, and our son was 14, 13 or 14, and we were hiking back out of the Grand Canyon on the Bright Angel Trail on the South Rim. Now when we were hiking out, there's a whole bunch, how many he, people here have been to Grand Canyon? Raise your hand. All right, a number of you have. If you've been to the South Rim right there at the Bright Angel Lodge, all those old cabins, there's a trail that goes down. In fact, the mules use that trail. We were hiking back out of that trail. And as we hiked back out, we came to a point where the switchbacks, well, let me show you right here. We were right here. There's a Coconino sandstone layer. It's almost 900 feet thick, travels all across the canyon and everything. We're hiking up and starting all these switchbacks. And as it came around the switchback right here, here's a guy standing. It's probably about 45, has a grizzled beard, a fly fisherman's vest, the hat, the cargo type shorts, the hiking boots. He looked like kind of an Indiana Jones kind of character. And he's standing there talking to a young woman in her early 20s. And as I walked around that switchback right there and started up the next section, over my shoulder, I heard him say to the young lady, and the Colorado River took millions of years to erode and downcut the canyon. And I turned around, and as I did under her breath, I heard Candy say, don't you say a word. <laughs> couldn't help it, couldn't help it. It's what I do. And so I turned to him and I said, sir, I couldn't help but overhear what you said. I said, how do you think the canyon formed? And he looked where we were standing this direction, way down that little ribbon of water at the bottom. He said, well, it's obvious. It took the Colorado River millions of years to erode the canyon. And I said, oh, really? He kind of looked at me. He says, why? What do you think? I said, well, what you wanted me to believe is that that little tiny bit of water, over a whole lot of time, that's what cut the canyon. I said, I don't think so. I think it's the opposite. I think it was a whole lot of water over a little short period of time that cut the canyon. Yeah. He said, well, you must be one of those creationists. Amen. Amen. I said, yeah, as a matter of fact, I am. So there we went back and forth three hours later. Yeah. That's why Candy gets a little upset with me. I mean, she, uh, she knows I go out there just looking for that kind of stuff. You know? <laughs> but what's the point, folks? Here you got two scientists standing at exactly the same point in time, looking at the very same piece of evidence. What's that evidence? The Grand Canyon. He says it formed over millions of years. I said it formed thousands of years ago. What's the difference? It's the world view. So he looked at that piece of evidence, already believing the world was billions of years old. 
So millions of years for the Colorado River to erode and cut the canyon was no problem for him. I looked at the same piece of evidence already believing that God's word said there was a huge catastrophic event called Noah's flood about 4,400 years ago. So thousands of years ago fit my worldview. Two people looking at the very same piece of evidence coming to a different conclusion. You know, I, I used to be really frustrated. Pastor, I'd set a good piece of evidence in front of somebody. Say, see how this shows creation? They'd look at that and say, what? That doesn't show creation. That just shows how it took 100 million years or something for that to evolve into that. I get really frustrated. <laughs> Finally, God gave me some peace as I worked in this ministry over years. I finally came to understand that evolutionists don't believe in evolution because they're stupid. Now that sounds wrong when I say that, but I'm serious, folks. Evolutionists don't believe in evolution because they're stupid. There's thousands of brilliant scientists that believe that evolution's how they got here. They don't believe in it because they're stupid. They believe in it because they are blind. They can't see the piece of evidence from the proper perspective. Let me illustrate that for you. There's a guy named Beaver that travels around the sidewalks of Europe painting pictures on the sidewalk of Europe. And as you look at some of these pictures, I want you to remember this guy is really talented. These pictures are flat. They are two-dimensional on the sidewalk, yet they look three-dimensional. I wish I had just one little fingernail worth of talent like this guy's got. But it's going to illustrate the point that I'm trying to get at. Uh, is actually, in this picture coming up, he painted a picture of, of himself on the sidewalk, so it looks like he's helping himself paint the picture. Wow. Can you tell which one's him? He's the one on the right. That's correct. Now, now, why am I showing you this? I'm trying to illustrate the point. Evolutionary humanists are blind. They cannot look at the evidence from the proper perspective. You remember that first picture I showed you? That's the wrong perspective. Let me show you what the creator of that painting intended for you to see when you looked at it from the proper perspective where those people are standing. It makes all the difference in the world. And do you know what? There is a passage in Romans chapter 1 verse 20 that says he, God, can be clearly seen by the things he has made, even his eternal power and Godhead. And then comes the indictment, so that they are without excuse. Do you realize that evolutionary humanism, vertical evolution, the way they teach it in the schools, is actually fits the definition of science fiction much better than the definition of science? What's the definition of science fiction? Well, it's a form of fiction that draws imaginatively on scientific knowledge and science, right? No, on speculation. This is their definition. Now, look at this quote by an evolutionist. He says, quote, while recognizing that much is unknown or perfectly known, I have been able to unfold the fascinating story of hominid evolution of the human brain using what? <laughs> using creative imagination. Restrained by rational criticism, of course. Look at this quote by another humanist. It is then tempting to go one step further and speculate that the entire universe evolved from literally nothing. What was the definition of science fiction? <laughs> By their own words. It's a form of fiction that draws imaginatively on scientific knowledge and on speculation. And then they have the nerve to say somebody like me or your pastor who believes that God created the heavens and the earth are ignorant, stupid, or insane. Look at this quote by Dr. Richard Dawkins. This guy is one of the most famous evolutionary humanists out there. He is traveling around the United States making an apologetic in our colleges and universities like I make a defense of the gospel. Look at this quote by Dawkins. He says, quote, It is absolutely safe to say that if you meet somebody who claims not to believe in evolution, that person is ignorant, stupid, or insane, or wicked. But I'd rather not consider that. Oh, she's talking about me. She's talking about you. If you believe God created the heavens and the earth. But did you notice what Dr. Dawkins said? Look closely at what he said. He said, it's absolutely safe to say if you meet somebody who claims not to believe in evolution. That's my point. Evolution is a faith-based belief system. You can believe in it if you want to. 
But remember, there's consequences. Has anybody in here read Darwin's book? A few people have read it? Okay. There's four things that every Christian needs to know about Darwin's book. It was, number one, published in 1859, a little over 160 years ago. Number two, it was, it was called On Origin of the Species. Number three, what was the one thing that Darwin did not discuss in his book? He didn't discuss the origin of the species. He talked about how one thing could change into something else, but never talked about where they came from in the first place. Yeah. Number four, what degree did Darwin have? Did he have a PhD in science? No. He had a BA, a Bachelor of Arts in Theology, the study of God. And some people question if that was even a valid degree. Now why am I telling you that? It's because today that book on origin of the species has become the evolutionary humanist Bible. They refer to that book with more reverence than some Christians refer to God's Word. Back in 1971 they made one of the largest reprints of that book that they've ever made. Millions of copies. Why? That was the year, 1971, when they were putting it in the public libraries, the public universities, the public high schools, and so forth. They printed millions of copies. And before they printed it, they asked a strong evolutionist named Dr. Harrison Matthews to write the introduction, the foreword to this reprint of Darwin's book. I want you to look what this evolutionist wrote. He wrote, quote, The fact of evolution is the backbone of biology, 1971. But look what he said next. He goes on. And biology is thus in the peculiar position of being a science founded on an unproved theory. Is it then a science or a faith? I agree with him. Well, I showed this quote at Virginia Tech University. A young man jumped, Oh, you creationist, you always twist what we say and make it mean whatever you want it to say. I looked at him and, No, we don't do that. We answer to a higher authority. But they do that to us all the time. Let me show you the rest of Dr. Matthews' quote so you can see the full context. He goes on, belief in the theory of evolution is thus exactly parallel to the belief in special creation. Both are concepts which believers know to be true, but neither up to the present has been capable of proof. And that's exactly my point. Now you need to understand that the evolutionists know that evolutionary humanism is a religion. It is a faith-based belief system. They know it, and now you know it. Don't go out there and ever again let one of them say, well, creation's religion. You want to believe that, that's okay, but evolution's science. No, it's not. It's a faith-based belief system. At least this evolutionist, on this quote, is honest. You know, Dr. Dwayne Gish of the Institute for Creation Research was one of those men that I had the privilege of knowing personally. And he's the one that taught me to make the argument that evolution's a religion or a faith-based system. Look at this quote by this evolutionist. He says, quote, I am an ardent evolutionist and an ex-Christian. But I must admit that in this one complaint, and Dr. Gish is but one of many that make it, the literalists are absolutely right. Evolution is a religion. This was true of evolution in the beginning, and it is true of evolution still today. Evolution, therefore, came into being as a kind of secular ideology, an explicit substitute for Christianity. At least this guy's being honest. I'll give that to him. Some of you may have saw Dinesh D'Souza's movie last year, before the election, Obama's 2016. I want you to look at this quote by D'Souza. He nailed it. He says, quote, It seems that the atheists have developed a comprehensive strategy to win the minds of the next generation. The strategy can be described simply, let the religious people breed them and we will educate them to despise their parents' beliefs. Many people think that the secularization of the minds of our young people is the inevitable consequence of learning and maturing. In fact, it is to a large degree orchestrated by teachers and professors to promote anti-religious agendas. He nailed it. That's exactly what's going on in the public education system. 
That drives me crazy, Pastor. So many parents today, we try to be diligent. We bring our kids to church. We bring them to Sunday school. We try to teach them the truth. And then when they get up to age 18, what do we do? They go to the University of Alaska or the University of Tennessee or the University of Georgia where they're taught a patently anti-God worldview that says there is no God. They walk into Biology 101 and the professor says, how many of you believe that God created the heavens and the earth? And maybe your student raises her hand and the professor will say, let me tell you how stupid you are for believing that religious mumbo jumbo. We've proved the world's billions of years old. And what happens to your student? They close up. And then the teacher sits there for the rest of the semester or the year and proceeds to systematically rip there's foundation and faith away from them. And let me tell you something, folks. They're really good at it. And what did I say earlier? Your young people want to believe evolution. That's the battle we're in. You don't think it's happening? Let me let you hear it out of one of these professors' own mouths if this clip will run. Let me summarize my views on what modern evolutionary biology tells us loud and clear, and I must say that these are basically Darwin's views. There are no gods, no purposive forces of any kind, no life after death. When I die, I am absolutely certain that I'm going to be completely dead. And when you die, you're not going to be surprised because you're going to be completely dead. Now me, now me, if I, if I live after I'm dead, I'm going to be really, really surprised. But at least, at least, I'm going to go to hell where I won't have all those grinning preachers from Sunday morning with me. That's just all that's going to be the end of me. There's no ultimate foundation for ethics, no ultimate meaning in life, and no free will for humans either. What an unintelligible idea. That's what they're teaching them. We don't realize the depth of the battle that we're involved in. We need to know. You know, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, considered to be the prince of preachers, the preacher pre the preacher's preacher, right? He lived back in the 1800s contemporary with Darwin. I want you to look what Spurgeon said in a sermon that he preached at the Metropolitan Tabernacle. He says, quote, there's not a hair of truth upon this dog of evolution from its head to its tail, but it rends and tears the simple ones. In all its bearing upon scriptural truth, evolution theory is in direct opposition to scripture. If God's word be true, evolution is a lie. This, he says, I will not mince the matter. This is not the time for soft speaking. I submit to you the year 2013 is not a time for soft speaking either. It's time that Christians begin to take this issue on. Take the bull by the horns if you want to use that cliche. We need to fight this battle because why? We're losing our young people. You know, people say, I believe God created it. I don't have to worry about it. You know, I, if you've got kids and grandkids, you better worry about it if you care about them. And that's what Answers in Genesis is all about. We're trying to bring the resources and the DVDs and stuff that you can use. People say to me all the time, well, Brother Jim, I, I, you know, I can't make arguments and, and defend things like you can. I don't expect you to be. I've been 20 years trying to figure this stuff out. And I'll tell you one thing I've learned. The more I know, the more I realize I don't know anything at all because there's so much more that can be learned. Now the good news. Creation is not based or subjected to the definition of science fiction. Why? Because it's built on the history book of the universe. The one book that's never been proven wrong. I was teaching down in the University of West Indies a number of years ago. It was my second or third trip down to Trinidad in Port of Spain. And I made a message similar to this in a young woman. I pointed this out yesterday. A young woman came up to me afterwards. Actually, she was this young lady right here. She says, why should I believe the Bible is true just because you say it's true? I'm a Hindu. We have our own sacred writings about how everything got here. Why should I believe the Bible? And you know what? That's a fair question. Most Christians can't answer it. 
I started it out in the last session. I'm going to point it out again. Let me tell you why it's possible for any logical, critical thinking person to come to the conclusion the Bible's the Word of God. Written by 40 different men, three different languages. Over a period of 1,600 years, that's a long time. It was written with one common theme. That's what God's doing in His creation. One common focus. That is the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. That's woven all the way through the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation. Never been found to contain a material error that affects its veracity or truthfulness. Never been found to be historically inaccurate when it speaks on matters of history. Never been found to be scientifically inaccurate when it speaks on matters of science. And that doesn't include the fact that over 100 prophecies were fulfilled when one man came to this world. Prophecies made hundreds or even thousands of years before he ever came. That last one alone makes it impossible for the Bible to be anything but the word of the Creator God. But you know, we have a problem even in the church today. Let me ask the question, how many of you here believe that the Bible contains the word of God? Raise your hand. No, it doesn't contain the word of God. It is the word of God. Every, I got them, Pastor. Get them every time. Gets them every time. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. Except the parts you don't like, you can ignore them. Is that what it says? No, but isn't that the way we live sometimes? Let me own up to it, folks. I have lived that way. Oh, I'm good with this part here. Thou shalt not kill. I'm good with that one. But this part over here, I don't think he really meant that, so I'm just going to kind of ignore that. Folks, what part about all don't you understand? And you know there's a passage in Exodus chapter 20 verse 11. It says, for in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is. What part about all don't you understand there? He made it all in six days. And you know what's interesting about that passage? All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Those men wrote down exactly what the Holy Spirit had them write them down. But God took the time for some reason to write this passage down on tablets of stone in his own finger. Twice. It's part of the Ten Commandments. Of course. As I mentioned, that's why we go into churches and do what we do and we talk about all these different subjects. Folks, we need to understand that we have to, if we have to, we need to drag our kids kicking and screaming to the foot of the cross. Now, you can't, you can't save them. But you can sure teach them a good solid foundation in God's word. But recognize that when you take them to the foot of the cross, you are going against the world in every area. It's not going to be popular. Your kids aren't going to like it. But you need to teach them. That's why we bring the books and the DVDs and stuff. Let me finish up quickly here. I, I mentioned a couple of these earlier. You know, these three books, the answer book, you know, one, two, and three are really great because they cover 90 of the most commonly asked questions. How do we know the Bible's true is a second series that we've started. There's also How Do We Know the Bible's True, Volume 2. I think she has a few of those copies on the table. There's now How Do We Know the Bible's True, Volume 3, which should be coming off the uh, publisher sometime very, very soon. And then we have those eight DVD sets that I have back there. I think Candy still has a few of them. Let me encourage you to pick up some of these. Remember, you can't get them on the AIG website or the ICR website. You have to purchase them here because that's the only way we have of getting them to you. And with that eight DVD set, there comes three things. Number one, you get a free DVD called The Grand Circle at 1,000 Feet. All those places out in the western United States, Grand Canyon, Zion Canyon, Bryce Canyon, Monument Valley, Mesa Verde, Canyon Diche, Arches National Park, so forth, what they look like from a small four-place airplane mixed with some of the views from the ground and some of the views from up above, set to some really beautiful music. The second Pre-DVD is a question of origins, cosmology, chemistry, biology done in a Discovery Channel type format. And let me just finish up right now with this. You see, today we have people saying and teaching to our young people that there is no God. Teaching that they evolved over millions of years. Well, the last cut on that free DVD is a song a young man sings, How Can You Say 
that there is no God. And it's a wonderful way to end the service, a wonderful way to contemplate the wonders of God's creation. Folks, let me tell you something. Evolution steals, takes away the glory of the creation that rightfully belongs to Jesus Christ. And any time a Christian begins to buy into this evolution thing, you are robbing Christ of his glory. Even in its fallen state, it is unbelievably beautiful. So as you watch this last, this clip that's on that free DVD with the eight DVD set, let me mention one more thing. That DVD set comes with copy permission. I give you copy permission for witnessing purposes. I want you to have a set. I want every family that can afford to buy one to buy a set. Keep it in your home. When somebody said, oh, of course the dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago. You say, wait a minute, I got a DVD you ought to watch. And you burn them a copy of the DVD that deals with dinosaurs and dragons. Don't give them your original one, you might not get it back. But of course, it's not intended, the copy permission is not intended for one person to buy a set and make everybody in the church a copy either. Because why? We take the funds that come from those eight DVD sets, we put them into the fund that we use to support and send those creation speakers and ministries to other countries like Peru, and now our first conference is coming up in Italy in April of next year. Let me just finish with it and just, folks, if there's somebody here that does not know Jesus Christ, you need to understand that he is who he says he is, that indeed he created the heavens and the earth. He made rules. Breaking the rules is called sin. Every one of us have broken the rules, but the good news is that he made a way to escape the coming judgment. You know, every human being has rightfully subjected to the death penalty. We're all under the death penalty unless that death penalty is commuted by Jesus Christ and his shed blood on the cross.